Yes, w well danced, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think you and I puzzled over, and we'll talk about Georgia Ricard here later, but we puzzled over. Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, featuring your hosts, Gabe Reinick and Ken Olio. Welcome back to the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. I'm Gabe Reinick, and I am in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I'm joined like I am every fortnight by Ken Olio. How are you, Ken? Not too bad, Gabe. How are you? I'm good. And you are in Lethbridge, Alberta. You were just telling us that your parsley crop uh, is uh, is having a bumper winter. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it is balmy. It's about ten degrees today. The grass is green. In fact, so there's a a house that was built basically kitty corner to us, um, late in the summer, and uh, it was unoccupied till about the start of October. And when they moved in, they decided to plant their sods like October fifteenth or something, and we we scoffed at them. Um, but I would guarantee that the last couple of days the sod has taken root and they will they will have grass in the spring. So they, well, there they we must go. have known better than I did. Yeah, well, I hope that they're looking at your parsley with envy too, because they probably didn't get that in when it was uh, when it was the time, eh? Um, you never know. So, yeah, but uh, so Ken, it, it may be balmy there, but um, but it's it's uh, it's definitely winter here in Fredericton. But uh, before we before we get to a related topic to that, um, you may have noticed, and the listener may have noticed, that we still don't have a new name for this podcast. We are still called the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, and in fact, Ken. Um, we're sponsored by the Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick, and we're sponsored by uh, SHRC. Yep, the University we... of Lethbridge SHRC Exchange Program. Mm -hmm. But we're also excited to announce that we have a website. We do, yeah. So, uh... And Ken, um, if the listener wanted to go to that website, what would they type into their browser? Well, just like you email us every week, listener, New Brunswick Archaeology, A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y, at gmail.com. Now you can go on the internet and log on and go to New Brunswick Archaeology, archaeology spelled A R C H A E O L O G Y dot com, and you will arrive at our RSS uh, podcast website, soon to be some kind of other website. Um, we have all sorts of new trash in our inbox from the various free website builder sites that I have explored. Um, and uh, uh, at some point in the coming months, you will see not just a redirect. But uh, that URL will take you to the hottest location in New Brunswick archaeology. That's right, listener. So um, also, if you're an expert in search engine optimization, we may have an opening for you on the uh, volunteer board of the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast. So yeah. um, please do check out our website um, and uh, and and celebrate that we have we have acquired such a hot piece of Internet real estate. Um, Indeed. But Ken, uh that's uh that's uh that name we're going to keep because that's crucial for search engine optimization but we are it curious is. in renaming uh, about renaming this podcast and so um if the lucky uh and, i'm and just realizing that S seo the the acronym that we were trying to figure out so it is search engine optimization that's what wikipedia told me excellent um, okay well there you so, go yeah. we've all learned something today <laughs> Well, you and I have. I don't know that anyone else has, but the uh, <laughs> that's really why we're doing this anyway. Um, so, uh, but but we would perhaps like a name with a little more pizzazz for this podcast. Do you, would you agree with that, Ken? I well, it's always welcome. Suggestions so, are always welcome. Exactly. It's uh, you know, and especially um, you know, here, uh, you know, I'm I'm tuning in from the land of eternal darkness right now. Um. If we had a little more excitement uh, in our uh, in our uh, in our name, that might be just the ticket uh, to you know help with seasonal affective disorder and all sorts of other things. But so uh, the the listener, we've got a special uh, special prize this fortnight. If the listener were to um, tune in and uh, and uh, and while they're tuning in, be inspired to send in a new name for this podcast. This is the and Ken, if they, if they were to do that, where would they email that that name? That would be to New Brunswick Archaeology, uh, all one word, New Brunswick Archaeology, archaeology is spelled A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y, New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. That's right, listener. And if we were to open that up and find an email from you with the successful new name for this podcast, uh, let's just give you a little, a little uh, insight here into what you might get. So, Ken, Chili is not just a fine series of restaurants at the Calgary airport. It's the weather outside my window here in Fredericton. 
Uh, so I know I'm thinking of warmer climes. Um, do you know what happens on February 18th? Uh, no idea. Probably the the darkest point of the winter. No, 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 not not for the lucky, uh, not for the lucky winner, and for you and me, because that is the Daytona 500. Uh, that's right. For the Canadian listener, it's about a Daytona 5300. Well, that's right. It's the Super Bowl of stock car racing, and we're happy to announce the first NV Archaeology Podcast stock car sponsorship. That's right. There's going to be going to be a car with uh, with our swag all over it, and that's because we're sponsoring a team. Uh, listener, uh, the number thirteen that's named for thirteen K BP Motorsports, which uh, which Ken and I are 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 largely the owners of Toyota yeah. Camry XSE with its trademark hammerhead styling, with the slim upper grille opening that connects to the sharply angled headlights. And then below that feature, you're going to see the expanded lower grille flanked by a pair of curved vents. And above, the hood shaped by distinctive new lines and those reworked duct exits. Out back, it's going to be slimmer taillight detail cap off the updated rear of the car with sloping corners that lead to the bumper from a redesigned quarter panel. Under the hood, it's powered by a 5.9 liter naturally aspirated, that's yeah, 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 uh, V8 engine. <laughs> that's right, listener. So... You may be wondering how it is that Ken and I um, are just the people to pick the winning team and for this podcast to sponsor uh, what we're pretty confident is going to be a winning stock car entrant at this year, Daytona's uh, Daytona 500. And the way we did this, listener, was we spent last year um, pretty much every Saturday night at Speedway 600 in Geary looking for 660. just... The... Yes, sorry, 660 in Geary <laughs> looking for just the man to send to Daytona. Uh, we were there for the Riverview season opener. We were there for the Targets Windows and Doors 100. We were there for the Ganong Mocha Modifieds. And we were there for the Ricky Bobby 150. And we found just the boy to do his Charlotte County Daddy proud at the Great American Race. So, listener, if you want to join 13K BP Motorsports for a fast weekend, you send in that prize-winning name, and this is what you're going to get. You're going to fly from Manchester, New Hampshire to Orlando, Florida. There, you'll join your host. That's me and Ken. Uh, for Gator, served according to our own special recipe. We do this quartered. We do um, the uh, per- catacorner uh, quarters. We do uh, breaded in a nice little biscuit rub. And then the other we do blackened. And that way it resembles uh, the checkered flag that you're going to see waved when our guy uh, crosses the finish line in Daytona. We prop open the mouth with a bottle of Covassier and then stuff it filled with ice to keep it just the right temperature while you enjoy, uh, you enjoy the whole spread. Um, and this is going to be at our beachfront condo. And from there, we're on to Daytona, and you're going to have a warm-up ride with the official, uh, but still, we, we don't want to name him yet, NB Arc Pod driver. You can meet the pit crew, selfie with the Harley J. Earl trophy, and then we're going to have a couple of PBRs where we watch our boy come down the stretch to victory, and then we'll head you back to uh, Keswick to join in the victory parade. So, Ken, where can our listener write in to support our very own Rapid Roy? And uh, and possibly win this great prize with a new name for the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast. That would be coming to New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. New Brunswick Archaeology, all one word. Archaeology spelled A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y. New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. And I don't know what you think, listener, but even thinking about this, it sounds to me like Ken is talking faster than usual. But Ken, uh, if you were to open up that uh, that inbox uh, at the at the address you just described, what do you see in it? Uh, we actually have mail, so we've got our we've right. got our podcorn um, opportunities. Uh, we also have some emails from Squarespace and Wix. Um, at some point, I like I'm not entirely sure if the two dummy sites that I made in Squarespace and Wix are going to start trying to charge me money at and at any point. Uh-huh. Um, I'm also actually not entirely sure how to recover um, the uh, uh, the spaces that I prepared in those those in the Squarespace and Wix, but, huh. um, and, or how to link them up to the current URL that we have. Um, but we will figure all that stuff up in the, uh, in the background. And that's and why we have shirk a... money for a research assistant, I think. Exactly. Exactly. And so, uh, our first email is from Julia and it says, uh, it's titled podcast name. Hey, Gabe and Ken really enjoyed your latest episode. When I tell someone I'm studying archeology, span I always get one of two responses quote, Oh, like dinosaurs or quote, Oh, like Oak Island. On another note, I had a podcast name idea, The Eastern Edge. Get it? Like the edge of a trowel. I also had an idea about a logo design that could match that. that. You could have an outline of the New Brunswick or New England coast on one side and on the edge of a trowel on the other side. Oh. 
And uh, she says, cheers, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Well, so uh, Julia, yes, if you, you are, um, we will write you back. And if you, uh, if you were interested, we can probably get some podcast stickers coming your way. Yeah. Um, and we, um, do we, have... we might even be able to do some, some better swag uh, once we've seen that logo. It sounds quite nice. We could. Yeah. We could yeah. Potentially do swag for logos. I don't know how that would work, but. Well, my Photoshop skills, Gabe, if anybody has been on the Instagram page have been uh, pretty spot on lately. They um, really have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Um, and then we have a couple of emails from uh, our upcoming guest, actually, uh, uh, Dave okay. Black. And so, uh, okay, so the first one says pseudo-archaeology. And he says, hi, Ga- Ken and Gabe. Sorry it's been so long since I've written. I've been enjoying your podcast, but your up- output has been so prodigious that I've had difficulty keeping up. That's Thanks exactly what hit- Dave said uh, to us, incidentally, when we were writing our master's thesis. You know, it was just that we were, <laughs> we were working so quickly and in such abundance. <laughs> uh, thanks to, for doing the hit piece on the sea urchin paper with Catherine Patton and Arthur. Uh, I paper. particularly enjoyed your two episodes on pseudo-archaeology, and I want to touch briefly on some issues raised in them. First, One Oak Over the Line, best episode title yet. That is, a, it is it was excellent and, and even had the g- joke delivery with it. Um, Let me clarify my metaphor about Norse archaeology. To me, Norse archaeology in the Maritimes is like if archaeologists found out about a thousand years ago, five guys from Cahokia spent a long weekend in what is now New Brunswick, and as a result, a substantial portion of the funding, energy, and attention available for regional archaeological research was devoted to finding out what those five guys did during those three days. If Daryl is correct about good and interesting archaeology being done on Oak Island in the background behind the TV show, in part because that work was being conducted on provincial license, that raises a bunch of issues about transparency. For example, why can't those interesting results be disclosed in a professional or popular stream parallel to, but separate from the TV show? And we talked about how, you know, maybe one of the things that, like, we don't have access to this sort of, um, uh, these great production values, basically. And that was another thing, actually, we, I remarked on, um, the listener remember last week in, in our, our hit piece, we talked about the, um, pot, the Ideas podcast and how well produced it was. Um, and how it kind of took a cue from that sort of pseudo archaeological uh, production uh, in sort of overproducing things in a way that kind of catches people. Um, I was struck by your conversation about how the Oak Island TV show engineers aha moments where some piece of material culture is instantaneously interpreted to support a pet theory. That is precisely the sort of unscientific reaction to archaeological objects that should be discouraged. Instead of aha moments, we should encourage ooh, ah moments where people, a uh, avocational archaeologists, students, members of the public are surprised by heritage objects and appreciate them, at least initially for the unfamiliarity and their aesthetic appeal. Um, he thanked me for the story about Curry Mountain. Um, he hadn't heard that one before, but George Frederick Clark apparently recounts a somewhat similar story involving a Viking ship in Six oh. Salmon Rivers and another. Okay, so I'll have to read that. Actually. Interesting. Um, I'll tell you about my encounters with similar myths in a separate email. And lo and behold, we have that separate email. Ahoy, mateys. Here may be a tale <laughs> of two places in southern New Brunswick called Money Cove. Okay, so this is this is... Uh, like a full story oh, wow. here, listeners. So this is a um, uh, a maritime myth. Um, All so right. I'm going to pull this actually onto this window, so it's a little bit easier to read. Great. Uh, so this is a pla- two places in southern New Brunswick called Money Cove. The first Money Cove, in this case, an official play na- uh, place name, is located on the west side of Graham and Ann Island, north of Dark Har- Harbor, and just south of Beals Eddy Pond at the mouth of Money Cove Brook. There's a long-standing legend. I know exactly which- where he's talking about already. Okay, which uh, he did include some pictures, actually, which includes, among other elements, pirates, a widow from Campobello, a headless apparition, enchantments, dreams and visions that Captain Kidd's treasure was. um, And so this is there's a longstanding legend that Captain Kidd's treasure was buried in a hog's head at Money Cove. Apparently, several attempts have been made to find this treasure. I first heard of this Money Cove early in the summer of 1983 and was able to visit in 1995, but I didn't know of the legend then. I won't belabor the story here because various versions are available on the internet. The second Money Cove is located on the west side of the northeastern Bliss Island. I heard about it soon after I began the Bliss Island archaeological project late in the summer of 1983. Uh, In this case, Money Cove is not an official place name. It was given to me by fishermen working in the area. It's It's a deep northwestern exposed cove with an extensive intertidal zone and a salt marsh located partway between the Rum Beach site and the Northeast Point site. Yes, exposed to the northwest. 
do. Ken may wish to mix in some spooky movie background music at this point. Oh, I may, I may just do that. Those familiar <laughs> with my recent pub- publication on intertidal archaeology will understand why. And uh, Dave, I think, has anticipated actually one of our hit pieces today. He has, indeed. Uh, I was told that there was treasure buried in the marsh at Money Cove, that the rock outcrop overlooking the marsh was the marker for the treasure, and that people had dug for treasure there several times. I visited the cove twice, once in 1983 and again in 1986. Um, and he provides a couple photos, which maybe we will post with his permission on the socials. Long enough to convince myself that there were no obvious archaeological sites in the vicinity. The rock outcrop is salient and rises out of the marsh. Um, near its base is a circular, strikingly symmetrical, water-filled hole in the marsh. This hole may be natural, may be man-made, or it may be a natural feature that has been humanly altered. It is large enough to appear on aerial photos and certainly large enough to suggest a quote money pit to those inclined. Sorry, sorry. P- Ken, Ken, could it be, could it be a money pit <laughs> to those inclined to, Oh, I like this term piratical speculate speculations. Um, I don't know its depth, but it's deep enough to have persisted for decades. There may be a relationship between the Grand Manan legend about its Money Cove and the story I was told about Money Cove on the Bliss Islands. I did not investigate the Money Cove location or its legend further while I was conducting work, field work on the Bliss Islands. By the mid-1980s, there were rumors circulating that we were not conducting archaeological research on the islands, but rather were treasure hunting or looking for lost mines or prospecting for precious metals, etc. I didn't want to encourage that sort of speculation by paying attention to a location with a treasure legend attached to it. One of the issues I see with TV shows like Curse of Oak Island is their potential to fuel public suspicion and spurious speculation about the motivations for archaeological research, fair winds, and following seas, Dave B. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. um, uh, Our our esteemed guest today uh, may have to elaborate on uh, what uh, what the listener, uh, these legends of uh, of Money Cove. uh, uh, And so, so yeah, that was that was that was a hot mailbox this week. That was a hot mailbox this week, and thank you very much for that, Dave. And just uh, so, Ken, should I just go ahead and introduce our guest? I think so. Yeah, I think that okay. I think we're at that point of the show. This is I, I I set this 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 introduction up to be as if we hadn't already introduced our guest. So so, listener, I'm going to ask you to just forget what you just heard Ken talking about. And I I know that's hard, listener. I know that's hard, but the uh, but I think you'll find a way. <laughs> so. And and I think that the listener will also find that this uh, the chronology of this episode is actually. Um, uh, seems stable uh, because uh, we're we're back to our comfort level, which is uh, we record everything tooth to tail. That is the uh, the TARDIS is in the shop, is what Ken is saying. <laughs> uh, and so uh, our guest today uh, received his PhD from McMaster, and uh, following a postdoc in uh, I think paleoethnomalacology at the Royal Ontario Museum, he joined the faculty here at the University of New Brunswick, where he essentially founded the archaeology program uh, in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, he's the author, author of numerous books and articles about New Brunswick archaeology, especially um, about the Quadi region or the Pasquati Bay region, including such hits as Out of the Blue and Into the Black, the middle to late maritime woodland transition in the Quadi region, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, and uh, also his book, Living Close to the Ledge, Prehistoric Human Ecology of the Bliss Islands, uh, Quadi region, New Brunswick, Canada. He's been the lead scholar on the George Frederick Matthew Collection uh, at UNB, which we'll talk about here shortly. George Frederick uh, re- Clark. Sorry, yeah, sorry, George Frederick Clark. I do that all the time. The, <laughs> I apologize. Sorry. Yeah, uh, it it it's this is so the, the the listeners should know that I do this from a written script in which I've written George Frederick Matthew. So, I'm <laughs> <laughs> and I and I missed that on a, on my read through. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, recently retired, he's remained active, especially in publishing and facilitating the publication of work based on. Decades-long collaborations with Responsible Collectors, which is sort of the topic of our uh, show today. He recently received the Smith-Wittenberg Award from the Canadian Archaeological Association, recognizing his career achievements in Canadian archaeology. And we're, of course, speaking about David Black, uh, who's joining us from Fredericton, New Brunswick. How are you, Dave? I'm great, and I'm really honored to be uh, invited to participate in your podcast. I love your show, guys. Oh, thanks so much. We're honored to have you. And and uh, this is your first appearance, Dave, where we're not uh, in the pub. Yeah, yes, that's right. All the other appearances have been pub appearances. Before we go on to other things, I just wanted to mention, I was um, I was looking at some of George Frederick Clark's material today, and I was reminded that there's another legend for people who are collecting these kind of legends, 
uh, that uh, I forgot to mention in my uh, in my email, and that is George Frederick Clark has a golden calf legend about the central St. John Valley. So anybody who's interested in that should go out and get a copy of, of the fourth edition of his book, Someone Before Us, and uh, take a look at that. It's fascinating how this kind of stuff gets perpetuated. Yeah, eh? It's yeah. cre created and perpetuated. Yeah. Yeah. Does that explain why we're all cursed? Is that what it's about? It, it, there is a weird biblical undertone to the whole thing, but it's not really that. It's really just a classic treasure story. Oh, cool. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, so so Dave, we there's any number of things we could talk to you about um, with New Brunswick archaeology, which uh, you essentially invented. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, we're we're going to talk today because we envision this as being a, a local version of some of your collaborations with responsible collectors. And so I thought maybe we could start just by asking um, how you began working with responsible collectors um, and and what some of those initial insights were that led you to realize it made sense to work with avocational archaeologists and collectors. It, it, it really came about in two ways. Um, the first part of it started before I even had a faculty position at UNB. That's when I was still a graduate student. And uh, one summer when I was working in the Kauai region, um, uh, one of the um, field crew that I had with me uh, knew some people who lived on Deer Island. And since we're working on Deer Island, uh, we got in touch with those people because um, we wanted to uh, um, live in a cabin they had on their property for a couple of weeks while we did field work. And it turned out they were artifact collectors and they were the first uh, sort of avocational archaeologists that I met in, in that area. And and um, so, and they were the people who got me started on the whole intertidal archaeology thing, which has become a sort of interesting part of my career. Uh, so that was one of the ways it started. But the other way it started was that uh, within a few years of my getting um, a faculty position at, at UNB, people started to get in touch with me and ask me questions about stuff. Uh, often archaeological artifacts, but not always artifacts. Archaeological artifacts, and um, and in the in the early days, you know, this was you know right at the beginning of the computer revolution. Um, you know, I would get letters in the mail, like snail mail letters, with sometimes with photographs included in them, and letters I, about what 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 is this? You know, I, I think Dave, yeah. I think Gabe, and I have have both received uh, uh, legal um, uh, legal letter folders that have a number of these pieces of correspondence in them, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The, uh... and, and so what I did was I started to build up a fire, file, and now there are, you know, paper files initially, and then digital files for scores of those kinds of contacts over the years. And some of them are really fascinating, like the one that you wrote up in your dissertation, Ken. So could could you two catch us up on the one that uh, that Dave first contacted, and then I guess Ken wrote up in his dissertation? The Washington Oak stuff, is that what you're yeah, referring yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. Referring to. So, yeah. so a guy who lives down in southern New Brunswick somewhere um, got in touch with me. And I think initially this was actually a snail mail letter with a photograph in it. He cool. had a piece of what was clearly Washington Oak shirt that he'd found on the Petticodiac River, I think, eroding out onto a, an erosional face. And uh, he just had no idea what it was. But it really... Um, made me wonder when I first saw it, uh, first saw the picture, because it looked like it was part of a fluted projectile point. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and it was only like, it was, it was like a decade and a half later before I actually held the piece in my hand. And it does look suspiciously like part of a fluted projectile point, And I'll let Ken take it over from there. So I'm just going to interrupt before Ken's collecting his thoughts to say that for Dave to say something looks suspiciously Paleo-Indian means he really has exhausted all other opportunities because he's he's got a bit of a Paleo-Indian allergy. The, the... Indeed. Yeah. And so so uh, the files that I got, like, so you must have continued correspondence with this individual because I think some of the photos that I had were from, would have been um, from the late 2000s kind of thing, sort of like I think it was around 2007 or something like that. But um, it ended up being one of one of probably five, I think it was five or six in total uh, projectile points that are uh, reminiscent of fluted 
or or late Paleo Indian artifacts that are all made on what um, I, I I think the way that I danced around it was that these are all <laughs> these are all made on material that is. Uh, uh, strongly reminiscent or something like that. I, I can't remember what the terminology was that I used, but essentially these look like Carboniferous cherts that in any other context you would call Washtemo chert. And that the challenge there is that like, you know, that the Bellier's Cove source for this material, which we would, uh, um, which is where most of the stuff comes from, would not have been accessible at that time. Basically it would have been submerged. So um, uh, it's not really clear where the stuff is coming from, but it's it's a related Carboniferous chert. Um, uh, I think is kind of essentially and and I so so the way I dance around the Paleo Indian ness of it is that these are reminiscent of late Paleo Indian and you know uh, late fluted points, um, and uh, and if they are made on Carboniferous cherts, uh, uh, a quarry that we found in 2019 would be one of the candidates of places where you could get Carboniferous chert uh, that looks identical to uh, a number of these pieces. So, but yeah, it started started with a letter, I guess, to Dave back in. But so the I 90s. just want to point point out though that this is like a, a great continuation of one of the themes we've been chasing as we've been talking to people about um, working with responsible collectors, which is that it's particularly useful for chasing out um, the kinds of archaeology that's not going to lend itself to easy uh, approach just via conventional testing, right? So like, you know, paleo Indian sites, which are notoriously hard to find via testing, right? Um, the sort of obscure lithic materials, which may not be particularly well represented in regional literature, but are well represented in in um, uh, local literature. Um, and so I, I think that's really cool. Yes, w well danced, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well well i think you and i puzzled over and we'll talk about george Herbert clark here later but we puzzled over that um uh the my favorite term i think for um any any uh, uh aggressively basally thinned i, I believe yeah. was the uh uh the point that's in the uh the gfc collection that again is looks like heat treated carboniferous cherts from new brunswick right and and um you know, it is characteristic of what you would expect to see late Paleo Indian projectile points to look like. But again, it's it's one of these kind of curiosities, um, including a private collector that reached out to you from New York State that had uh, a possibly fluted uh, point that looks like it's made on Carboniferous Church from New Brunswick, and um, and yeah, and a couple other pieces from a site actually just outside of Fredericton in Marysville um, that are uh, pretty clearly Carboniferous Church, and one of which looks like it might be a channel flake. So. We should get aggressively basally thinned on the t-shirt, I think. <laughs> that, just to be clear, that's not my term. I stole that from Chris Ellis. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, okay, so we're we're uh, you mentioned Rum Beach, um, and we're gonna put uh your most recent Rum Beach uh piece, uh Gathering Pebbles on the Boundless Shore, in the show notes. Um, but tell us a little bit about Rum Beach and tell us a little bit about Rum Beach, uh kind of vis-a-vis -vis and intertidal archaeology in general, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, avocational archaeologists in the Quadi region? Well, in terms of Rum Beach, so that was the starting point for, for my research on intertidal archaeology. And how that happened was that those, the, those avocational archaeologists that I met in 1983 on Deer Island, um, a few years later, I was at their uh, place looking at some of their artifacts in their basement and uh, one of them said, oh, by the way, we have an artifact from the Bliss Islands. You'll want to see that. And I said, oh, yes, I do. And uh, thinking that it would be a piece of debitage, maybe a broken projectile point or something like that, that it eroded out from one of the sites that we were already doing research on. Instead, they gave me this huge flake made out of dark volcanic. OK, and uh, and I said, oh my goodness, where did this come from? And they pointed at the map and they pointed at Rum Beach, which is a place that I had been to, but it would never, never, never even occurred to me to look down and see if there were artifacts on that beach. It's just not the kind of place where we typically thought of finding artifacts. And so the next time I was out on the islands with students, I took some of them over on in the, in the evening 
And I said, just walk around this beach. It's low tide. Walk around the beach and see if you can find anything. One of them found an artifact 20 feet from what it, where I uttered those words within two minutes. <laughs> that's and great. So, and so that's where that whole project came from. And then from there, it bridged out into this whole thing about um, northwest facing coves and um, terminal archaic looking artifact assemblages being but, washed out in the on the shorelines. Uh, usually, that's great. So, as far as we can tell from underneath peat deposits. That's great. So we should catch the listener up a little bit. The And so the reason I'm guessing that you wouldn't have gone for this northeast facing beach is that the model for coastal sites is a southish facing site, right? Yeah. Almost all of the shell bearing sites, and in fact, many of the non-shell uh, sites that date to the last 3,000 years before European contact are all, all virtually all south facing, either southeast or southwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so a north, northwest, a northwest facing beach is facing into the prevailing winds and the winter weather um, in this part of the world. And so we would just never have thought of those as being places that people would live. So it's yeah. this gigantic flake in the basement of somebody's house that makes you go out and look around beach, which makes you find transitional archaic in the Quadi region, basically. That's basically the that's the story in a nutshell. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. And, yeah. And 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 the like the other thing that's going on in the um in these intertidal zones too is this sort of uh you're finding ter uh, transitional archaic stuff uh on the in intertidal zone beach because of this sort of uh, effect. I think it's was Sanger that called it chronological shingling, basically that like the oldest stuff is basically further out in the intertidal zone and 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 over time, um essentially what what's being found on the beach is becoming more and more recent basically right that uh, uh the older sites have been eroded out much earlier than the more recent stuff is would that be a correct interpretation of what what that, basically you've you've witnessed that's a good summary of what chronological shingling is but in fact that's not what's going on on these northwest facing coves oh interesting uh, what what i believe is happening is that while the um uh, the sites, the shell bearing sites, the woodland period sites um, that we mostly excavate in places like the Quadi region, the ones that are still partly preserved on the shoreline, while those were being created by people, what was going on in those marshy areas was the peat deposits that are sometimes a meter deep were being built up on top of um, habitation sites that date to the terminal archaic and po probably earlier because we do find some late archaic, um, uh, maritime archaic, in your terminology, gave artifacts in those sites as well, sometimes. So what I think is that, in fact, there was a whole different, people that had a different orientation towards uh, um, what's, the, what's a suitable place to live, a different orientation of whatever resources were there before 3,000 years ago. It's, it's a, and, and about that, we know very little in terms of detail. There's no bone preservation as far as we can tell. So it's just stone tools. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. And, and Dave, I'm reminded that you're talking about this about, and, and so it's inspiring, right? This is that this is all from talking to a collector. Um, and I had, I had uh, Josh Cummings, friend of the program in my office, uh, formerly your office uh, <laughs> a couple of days ago. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he has apparently some quote from uh, something you've written, but he came in, you know, in a bit of a huff and he said something like, I'm just going to cite that Dave Black thing where he says the uh, the transitional archaic to the early woodland is the most enigmatic thing that ever happened. <laughs> yeah, that that I think that's absolutely that it's certainly the most enigmatic part of uh, of the archaeological record in the Quadi region, and I would argue for most of the Maritimes, maybe yeah. all of the Maritimes, because um, uh, until until um, I started finding those um, um, or, or seeing those uh, terminal archaic artifacts coming out of intertidal zones and out from underneath salt marshes. There were a lot of archaeologists who were saying that that the terminal archaic in that sense never existed at all in the Maritimes, that it somehow sort of terminated at the uh, the north side of the Penobscot River, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's it's funny. I mean, how how many things terminate within one tank of gas of a major New England research institution? I think <laughs> it's, a, it's a sort of a theme, maybe. But the, yeah. Awesome. yes, yeah. So so I think we're obligated here as professional podcasters to reel us back in because 
I actually mostly want to talk, and we should get you back on to talk about the transitional archaic, uh, probably mm-hmm. more. Um, but we apparently advertised us that we were going to talk about uh, relationships with uh, collectors. Um, and so I think one of the just um, things that Ken and I wanted to kind of talk about is um, the the Rum Beach topic is a real sort of evocative, just we wouldn't know this if it weren't for a relationship with a collector. What is your um, sort of philosophical approach to um, relationships between professional archaeologists and collectors? So when you when you you, you mentioned, you know, you run to someone um, at dinner they say, I, I want to show you something in the basement. What do you think our uh, professional approach or orientation sort of towards the collector should be? Um, if people want to show us stuff, we should look and we should take it seriously. And and that, and that goes, I, I believe that that's true, even if it turns out that what they have is just a, an interesting looking rock that's just a rock, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that that we have to take if people show us stuff we have to take that seriously uh, I'll just give you one one off the wall example a, a guy sent me an inquiry one time because he thought he'd found a fossilized finger <laughs> okay. oh, cool which, which finger so, was it it was a giant <laughs> fossilized <laughs> finger by the way okay and 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 th- and I had to take that seriously and I wrote back to him and I did a bunch of research and I found out that there are these things that look like fossilized fingers and they are actually a particular kind of fossil. Now, I'm not going to chase that any further here. I'm just saying that you we have to take people seriously when they show us stuff. Okay. No, I just I, I want to thank Ken. Ken did this recently. A, a, a rock from Alberta uh, appeared in my kitchen uh, from one of my all time favorite humans. And, and Ken took it to the geology department to get us information on it, which was much appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. But a yeah, colleague yeah. of mine. Yeah. Who was able to I, I can't remember. What did it end up being? It was a. Uh... It's a rock from Alberta. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so that, so that's my that's my first point of contact is that when people ask me about stuff and show me stuff, I take it seriously, whatever it yep. is. But um, uh, and sometimes you, you if 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 people show you an assemblage of artifacts that they've collected, and there and there's stuff that you've seen commonly before. And and um, and uh, you know something about the, about them, and and really there's not, you don't think there's a lot that you're going to be able to learn from them. Then it's still your duty to teach them something about them, okay, or tell them something about them, okay. Um, so even if it's a, a late prehistoric projectile point, and there's dozens or hundreds of them known from the um, from the province, you still have to take that seriously, and you still have to say. Um, you know, you t- good, good on you for collecting that. It's a beautiful piece. You know, this is this is what I know about it, and you should curate that. You should keep that. Okay. You should report it to the government too. Okay. Because let's face it, there's there's um, a legal requirement, a duty to report in the province. But good on you for for collecting it. So, so I want to pick up on that because so how do you how did you um sort of manage that kind of the uh what is effectively a legal gray area in New Brunswick, right? And you know, in in, in the states, so we had this conversation with Bonnie Piplato and and in the states it's a little bit different where most states, and I and and Gabe, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um I it might be countrywide. Private property is private property. And if you find something on private property, it is completely legal or within your legal right to collect and and sort of manage those objects like that yeah ken you may have seen a yellow flag with a snake on it saying don't tread on me that uh (laughs) that doesn't stop at the border you know that's uh that's uh Um, that's uh 50 states (laughs) yeah so so um in new brunswick this is you know like we, we were explaining on the last episode that basically um uh and and some of your career would have overlapped with this where any collections prior to 2010 are considered um that was it was uh, legal to have collected those and private collections can be legally held by an individual as long as they've reached out to the province and kind of registered them and but how did you find the relationship in terms of um sort of ongoing communication um and and how to uh there's sort of an ethical 
uh, a responsibility and a public archaeology responsibility on the side of the archaeologist, but there are also these sort of legal frameworks that we work under. And how did you grapple with that or manage that? Um, um, and did you find that there were tensions that that uh, that came up? There, were, um, there was tension initially, but I think the tension is mostly dissipated. Um, so my reaction to that was that I simply warn people now. I tell them, you know, that there is there is a law in this province that specifies that you have a duty to report when you find archaeological artifacts. And you can go onto the internet and you can find out where you're supposed to report those things. Yeah. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's all I have to say about that, okay? The, I'm not the one who collected the artifacts. Um, and I'm happy to look at their artifacts and tell them about them. And I'm happy to borrow them and write them up and get them into the literature. Um, if that's possible to do, and I've done that on a number of occasions, mm -hmm. but uh, but uh, but to me, that's as far as my legal duty goes. I tell them what their legal responsibility is, and and that they should look into it, and that's that's it. Okay. Beyond that, my ethical responsibilities are to the archaeological record, to collectors and avocational archaeologists, and to other professional archaeologists. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Have you have you felt as though um, we're sort of getting to the the you you you've sort of hedged off the we we have this question here. What are the obligations of archaeologists? What are the obligations of collectors? You've kind of touched on that, but I think maybe what Ken was leaning towards, um, we were imagining handing you a a magic uh, legislative wand, and uh, but 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 you know you've won the Smith Wittenberg. I think it'd be a magic uh, legislative staff. You know something a little more Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and and what would you put forward i mean if, if you could you know it's the 1960s you're um uh god <laughs> what would you um what would you create for new brunswick legislation surrounding collectors i don't i don't know that i can really answer that question um i mean i think i think it's a mistake to um to have laws that criminalize people if the laws can't or won't or aren't enforced, okay? I think that's sort of wasted legal practice. But on the other hand, I do kind of understand the motivation for why governments want to pass those kinds of laws. Um, I, I, I would be more sympathetic in New Brunswick if I thought there was a huge problem in New Brunswick about people looting archeological sites. But the truth is, my experience is that very little of that goes on here. And that, in fact, most people who uh, in the past, in the present, and presumably into the future collect artifacts, they're doing them because they're interested, because they're hobbyists, because maybe because they're serious avocational archaeologists, and, um, and that they feel a responsibility towards the archaeological record that's not that different from the responsibility I feel. And that this stuff is like appearing on beaches, it's eroding out of sites, and and that information disappears with the next tide cycle or the next storm, basically. Yeah, the, yeah, that's the, the, my my thinking about this is all has evolved a lot over the years. When it, when I was an undergraduate, there was a lot of sort of anti collector sentiment still, and I think that's partly was a holdover from when the the discipline was professionalized in the in the sixties. Um, um, and, and I absorbed a lot of that when I was an undergraduate, but through my graduate career and onwards, I've sort of come around to the feeling now that, um, when people collect artifacts that have eroded out, what they're doing is they're giving those artifacts a future. And if they're not collected, you're absolutely right, Ken, they don't have a future. They're just going to be gone. Yeah. And, yeah, inf and whatever information they may hold is gone too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so your legislative wand is going to wave sort of this, this idea would be a little bit like how uh, I put in a syllabus that, uh, you know, the, uh, that uh, there's a drop dead deadline for particular things, but that's really just to kind of uh, the, the legislation has the effect of kind of shaking down the people that are going to be the kind of the bad actors, but there's always some nuance in there that, you know, there's a student that might email you and they've missed a deadline, but they show up to class and they, hand things in regularly and it's like okay you know that that's 
just just get it handed in on time kind of thing, right? Like that, you know, the, the legislation is there to keep people from digging up sites and from doing uh, and bad actors basically, you know, spook yeah. away people that might be coming in. Um, but that there is really um, there's a genuine interest and there is a, uh, uh, like a, you said, a responsible, well, well, I can always forget the responsible and responsive steward. Is that what the, yeah, that's the yeah. SAA phrase. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that in your career, you've interacted with some of these people and, and, and I think, um, there, there's an individual, I don't know if you want to talk about him, but, um, uh, from the Quadi region who, um, uh, I think factored into like throughout your career basically. And, um, uh, who, who is sort of recognized in your most recent version of the Rum Beach uh, report. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually, I'm not going to mention people's names here just because I, I didn't ask permission. I don't think I probably should do that. Sure. But, uh, but people who are interested, the, those names are in, uh, in some of the reports I have out. But, but um, let, me, let me come back to the legislative thing for a minute, okay? Um, so, so part of my feeling is... Um, I mean, one of, one of the things that's happened is that the internet, for example, has made it a lot easier for people to get in touch with me or in touch with you guys now to, to ask questions about things that they find, archeological things and other kinds of, of, of things that they find, okay? The other, the other thing that the, uh, that the internet has done is that it's made, uh, in theory at least, it's made it a lot easier for, um, uh, for um, um, People, people in the civil service and other people to interact with collectors in a more sort of positive way, okay? I mean, this isn't rocket science. It's, it's been done in lots of places in the world. Um, and and, and, uh, and uh, it's and a lot of it under the guise of citizen science. And there's no reason why we couldn't be here in New Brunswick like they do in many other places. And Maine's a good example of that. Uh, bring people into into the archaeology tent by including them in some kind of um, reporting mechanism that's really internet based. That means that they don't have to call up a civil servant. They don't have to, you know. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, it, then that would be, you know, I mean, the many people. I I know not you, Dave, but many people are walking around with cell phones, which are capable of <laughs> recording both images and the uh, the GPS coordinates of anything they might stumble upon. Yeah. Um, yeah. If absolutely true, and and uh, and we know that in some other parts of the world, uh, there are are systems where people uh, simply have some kind of software on their phone. If they find an art archaeological artifact um, on a shoreline, that uh, wrote it out on a shoreline or something like that, they simply take a picture of it, um, and uh, they send that information off to whatever um, uh, information gathering system they're hooked up to. Um, I'm not a birder myself, so I don't know about this personally, but I was doing a little bit of background research about these kinds of things a couple of years ago. And one of the things that I came across is this thing called eBird, which was started at Cornell University and is now worldwide and has something like half a billion data entries on it. And it is yeah. a, it's a worldwide network on the internet where people report bird sightings. Okay. Yeah. When I worked oh, for cool. Parks Canada, we had... Uh... Um, there was a, an Audubon app that you could use that you could upload information to, like where you take a, a picture of a bird or something that you see. Um, but there was also within the parks, like the the app for the park, there's a place to report, like if you saw an animal sighting or something like that in particular locations, because it helps them track animals basically throughout the park. I also have an app that uh, uh, you can take a picture of a plant. It identifies it by species and you can geotag it if you want particularly if it's a rare species of plant um, uh, because it'll like feed into this larger, like it's where people, like people draw out of this data set, this kind of like um, uh, citizen accumulated uh, data set. And, and, you know, like, uh, and, and what you're getting at, and, and this is something that um, I kind of had. So I, w I was out with a couple of collectors in the quad a few years ago. And um, part of the reason I think it's important um, in a place like the, the quad or coastal areas is because of the impacts of erosion and because um, it's not just a it's not just that they're interested in what's going on. It's not just that they're um, acting in some cases, like you said, you know, like avocational archaeologists, they know what what's going like they know what they're finding and that kind of thing. It's that they're always there, right? And so there's a monitoring aspect to this that also gets to the limitations and the logistics of doing archaeology in a region like this and where there are limited people, limited number of people. There's a limited amount of uh, funding. 
Um, and and there are way more members of the public than there are archaeologists out there. And and they know the landscape in a way that, you know, I'm on a boat with these two guys and we round the corner of an island and they immediately recognize that there's a tree that's fallen over just over the winter and exposed a whole area, basically eroded out kind of a whole downslope area. And so something was changed on the island in a way that probably had the an impact on some of the archaeological resources. And lo and behold, we get out of the boat and immediately there's this giant grooved axe that one of the guys finds like, you know, two minutes after disembarking basically. Right. And, and right by where this, you know, this tree had been basically ripped out by just natural erosion over the course of the winter. Yeah. That's, that's a good point about, about collectors is that they, is that they're, they're there and, and they're, they're the people who can be on the, on the ground to look for stuff after erosional events. There, there is no way that archaeologists can do that for a whole bunch of reasons that we don't necessarily need to go into here. Um, and and the other the other thing about collectors is that um, collectors know everybody in their neighborhoods. They they know the landscape, but they also know everybody. And so, if somebody who doesn't know anything about archaeology finds something, then they find out about it, and then we find out about it. Okay, an excellent example of that is that. Um, Popeye birdstone that was found, complete Baba Popeye birdstone that was found in the Quadi region a few years ago. Okay. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that's the only Popeye birdstone that's ever been found in New Brunswick. Am I right about that? As far as I know, maybe even if you extend, if you combine New Brunswick and Maine, I think it's the only Popeye birdstone in that whole region. Okay. Yeah. So so the the gentleman who found that was walking along a shoreline, um, just going about his business. He thought it was a piece of metal when he saw it in the sand, and that's why he picked it up. He didn't recognize what it was. Uh, he had no idea what it was. He just knew that it was something that was pretty interesting looking. Um, how I ended up having, having an opportunity to look at it was because the guy who found it knew a guy who knew a collector, and the collector got to look at it, and the collector contacted me. You know, So we're already four people down the line, okay? But but that's that's another function that that collectors and avocational archaeologists fill is that they they're networked in a way that archaeologists can't be networked if they're not in the local community. Yeah, I mean the, the same thing happened to me and uh, when I was doing field work a few years ago. So the the place where we stay in Belle Isle Bay, the innkeeper uh, there was a young uh, young kid probably I think he was like eight or ten years old or something found a projectile point of like a bleached volcanic on a, on a beach on the Kingston Peninsula one day. And she knew we were archaeologists out there. So we get home and she's got a picture on her. We get back to the, the inn and she's got a picture on her phone. She shows me of this projectile point that this, um, it was a friend of hers son had found it and uh, uh, had the friend of hers knew that archaeologists were staying with her doing some field work. And so I saw this picture the next day it's in like the telegraph journal or something like that. And, and they did, the province actually ended up uh, coming down and, and, and meeting with the kid and, and kind of like describing it and everything like that. So I didn't actually see the actual artifact, but it's this sort of word of mouth thing that as soon as you're sort of in an area, people know who to talk to. Right. And so everybody gets, it's, it's neat, you know, like if people get excited about you being, you talked about the, the digital tent that people come into. And, and when we talked to, Bonnie, Piplato, and and Gabe and Matt have done this in Nova Scotia. Sometimes there's also a great idea of having an actual physical tent, you know, like where you, you know, you're set up in a place where people can come and see you and talk to you and show you things that they've found. Um, uh, because, you know, it's it's a little bit more accessible and you get a kind of that firsthand uh, conversation with people as well. And Dave, you've done a bit of that at, at places like uh, the Greens Point Lighthouse and that sort of thing. And and the yeah. reason I bring that up is I just kind of wanted to transition towards you. You kind of mentioned this um in some of your early comments, but if you were to, to sort of, uh, Ken and I know a bit what it's like to be a young archaeologist studying with you, but you know, you, you get a, a young archaeologist who is a better student than Ken or I, and uh, and uh, they say, well, well, what, what are our obligations towards collectors? Um, you've outlined that a little bit, but just specifically sort of in terms of, I wonder if you could frame that a bit more in terms of our research outputs. So the sort of things that we're actually writing or we're putting online or we're publishing. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? 
Yeah, I, just to reiter, reiterate what I said before, and that is that we, you have to take people seriously if they bring stuff to you. But but the other thing I would say to young archaeologists is the reason that one of the reasons that you want to do that over and above the ethical responsibilities is that someday somebody's going to bring you something that's going to put you on a research track that you never thought yeah. you were going to be on. And, and so that's and, the rough beat scenario. Yes, and I know a number yeah. of people that's happened to. That's not that's not an uncommon scenario. Okay, so so that's another reason to to uh, to be alert to this kind of stuff. Yeah, I want to come back to the, one, something we were talking about before, though, just for a moment before we go on. And that is we were talking about these sort of systems that they have in some parts of the world for people to report using cell phones and, and digital technology and stuff like that. And it, we shouldn't lose folk, uh, lose sight of the fact that archaeology is a little bit different from some of those other things. It's not going to be like eBird because it's not the 19th century anymore. We aren't shooting the birds and collecting them. Okay, we're just taking <laughs> pictures and putting them in a database. So, so archaeology shoots the bird. Is this where we're going? Well, yeah, no, that's yeah. not where we're going. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> where, where we're going is that one of the things that that we could ask. Uh, this is a question that we could ask. If we have those kinds of systems, do we tell people collect the artifact, or do we say take a picture of it, log it into the system, whatever that system is, but don't pick it up? You know, I mean that is an alternative. Okay, if part of the um, concern is about collecting stuff, having people collect stuff, it's it's at least uh, worth having an ethical and practical yeah. conversation about that. But but do you think that part of the problem in that would be that I, I think that one of the things that um, part of the reason that it's important to work with uh, collectors is that it's important for responsible collectors to get something out of that relationship, right? To get um, a kind of affirmation, to get a recognition that their perspective is important and it's, that it's something unique from what archaeologists can offer. Um, and also to really have access to... Uh, um, what the data produces, right? So this feeling that, well, I picked up this artifact. And so as a result, other archaeologists were able to look at it. They were able to do all sorts of things with it. It didn't erode away. I kind of saved it. Um, yeah. and, and I worry that uh, just sort of putting something into the digital world by taking a picture of it doesn't have that same uh, possibility. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, that is one of the motivations for collectors is is to have a collection of objects of artifacts yeah. um, and, and 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 it's funny because new brunswick actually kind of has a way to manage this and that they in the heritage conservation act they're like one of the permit classifications is an avocational permit it's not clear to me whether anybody has actually held an avocational permit but i think the spirit of the idea of issuing permits for avocational archaeologists was that um it would facilitate people collecting objects and and i don't know if it's ever like there's all the it's fraught with a whole bunch of other issues but i think the spirit of the idea was probably that you know if you're going out there instead of taking the picture you're legally allowed to collect that object uh but there's a sort of a responsibility on the other end which is that you have to um uh uh you know just deposit those artifacts with the province and I don't know, produce some kind of notes or or reporting on your activities or something like that. But I, I don't know if it's ever like it's it's outlined in the in the legislation, but it's I don't know if it's ever been used or not. Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's ever been used either. I doubt it. it did. My problem with that is that, that it was too much old school thinking. OK, and it, I mean, having those kinds of licensing requirements for professional archaeologists is perfectly reasonable and understandable, but you can't expect uh, avocational archaeologists to behave like academics or to behave like civil servants. Okay, so so having something like the uh, an archaeological equivalent of the eBird thing seems to me to be much more, um, much more practical. It's a much more practical way to to address the problem. Um, to come back to Gabe's point, though, I think having a collection of artifacts is absolutely one of the motivations that um, that uh, collectors have. Um, and and uh, and to be able to hold those, we all know the the um, the frisson that people get when they hold a really really exquisite artifact, something that's really unusual, really old, really whatever. You know, 
Uh, and that and that's part of the motivation for collecting them. And that's something that we don't want to take away from collectors. If uh, the powers that be start confiscating people's collections for whatever reason, then that simply drives all of that activity underground. Yeah. And so that's something we want to stay away from. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I also think that the public are are not fools and they see articles in the CBC about the curation crisis and they hear provinces saying that they have no room to store artifacts and they think to themselves, well, why are you so keen to get your mitts on my stuff, you know? Right. I mean, there's yeah. all sorts of practical considerations about that, for sure. I, I mean, I, and even with the interactions that I've I've had with um, with collectors have given me pause about some of the things that I do. So, for example, I've I've borrowed artifacts from collectors in, in order to do some analysis on them and to write them up. And and if there's more than a few pieces, you have to have some kind of management system for that. And so often, what I do is I end up putting each piece in a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag, and putting putting a tag on it with a number or an identification thing or something like that. And when I give the objects back to the collector, they're all in these plastic bags, okay? So then what do they do? Do they, you know, do, we don't want to encourage them to write on artifacts anymore because we don't write on artifacts anymore. But on the other hand, do we say to them, make sure you keep the bags with the artifacts because, you know, that that's what keys them into whatever you've written up or something like that. But but in a way that kind of that kind of spoils their ability to have that hands-on contact with our with their collection. So yep. you know there, there's mm -hmm. all sorts of things like this that that we haven't worked out the details of yet. Yeah. Uh, the other the other thing I want to say about collectors is uh, collectors like to have collections. They like to have people look at them. They like to have professionals look at them. They like to learn about them. But collections can become a problem for them when it comes to handing collections on generationally. Okay. Yeah. And, and it, I know a number of collectors who are, who are and have been in this quandary. And really, there's no good advice to give them. Okay. They, you can say to them, okay, really the responsibility, the responsible thing to do is while you're still able to do it, you should donate these artifacts to the provincial government so that they go into the, into the provincial government's um, storage facilities, okay? Most collectors I've talked to are very, very hesitant to do that. And not because they're anti-government or anti-legislation or anything like that. It's because they don't want the artifacts to leave the vicinity in which they were found. Yep. And it's very, and that and that's a problem that's become worse, not better, because small museums, there's fewer small museums now, uh, not more. Uh, there's there's fewer places that artifacts can be stored and displayed. They're uh, except in people's homes. And um, and um, as people get on later in their lives, and this becomes a, a quandary for them. So that that argument about local uh, control, I think, in in many ways, actually mirror or mirrors or follows um, indigenous concerns as well about artifact repositories. Absolutely, it's, and it's access too, right? It's it's this issue of of like, um, is it in a banker's box on a shelf somewhere, or or is it somewhere where you could call up an individual and say, "Do you mind if I bring somebody over to come see this stuff?" Right, like that's. Um, uh, you know, and it, it's very different, right? Like, uh, you know, there's, uh, to get access to once something is accessioned, you know, uh, and into a provincial repository becomes a very, um, there's a very formal process that you need to even just get access to that stuff, um, to view it. Um, and, and that would include the people who, who would have donated that collection, right? It becomes a more complicated process to even engage with this stuff that they probably have a very deep personal connection to. Um, but anybody else that wants to learn from it, it also becomes more difficult, right? Yeah, and, and it becomes onerous because because uh, a collection repositories tend, tend to be centralized. So people yeah. who don't live close to the center where that repository is, they have to travel distances to see stuff they donated, even if they're able to get to see it. Yeah, um, it's a long ways from Marysville to Rum Beach. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I think too that... Um, I know from talking to some collectors is that they have a poor understanding of how museums operate too. They, 
they often think that, I think that, or at least sometimes think that when they donate things to museums, their stuff's going to be on display and it's going to be on display in perpetuity. And of course, museums can't do that. They can't operate that way. Almost every museum we can imagine has uh, basements and rooms and attics full of stuff that they have never displayed and probably never will display because it's outside their mandate or their, their or they just don't have enough display space or whatever. Um, and but but yet they feel this ethical responsibility to take stuff that's donated to them. Well, Dave, this is one way in which I think New Brunswick is ahead of all of us, and that they've made their museum imaginary. <laughs> it's. I'm not sure we want to go down that road. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> but you know, I mean that. I mean the issues with the New Brunswick Museum are 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 just a larger piece of what I was saying earlier about small museums disappearing. Um, sure. Or becoming seasonal rather than than permanently open or whatever. Yeah. 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 I think that's all a great point. I mean, because I I I think this also comes back to I mean your point at the beginning about the the public is the reason you pick up the arrowhead on the beach is because you're interested in this right and so the idea of a system in which you don't learn more about it and in which you don't have access to it yourself to try to learn more about it on your own is just not a rewarding one yes i I think that's true collectors have to have some kind of reward uh doing i don't i don't think it's the case that we necessarily have to offer to reimburse them for time or or expenses mm-hmm. or anything like that. I mean, in a way, they're hobbyists. You have to expect that your hobby is going to cost you money and time. Okay, and and I don't think that's an issue for most collectors anyway. Um, I mean, I know there are other jurisdictions in other parts of the world that do that, but but I don't see any reason why we we would that would be an expectation here or, or that we should go down that route. But we somehow we have to be able to give something back to them. It has to be information and it has to be retention of their collection, at least in the short term. What's so, the most interesting thing you've ever seen in a private collection, Dave? Private collection. Wow. Um, it, it could be that oh, birdstone. I, that's pretty extraordinary. But it, 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 that, that birdstone is absolutely extraordinary. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I never expected to actually have one of those in my hand. Yeah. It wasn't already in a museum collection, okay? Sure. Uh, and I certainly never expected to see one of those that had been collected in the Quadri region. I, I was just completely flabbergasted when I was told about that. Um, but but in terms of collections, well... Um, just to, just I, I mean, for the listener, I, yeah, um, we didn't talk about this earlier, but can you explain to the listener the significance of a Popeye birdstone? I, I think that that was that's one thing we kind of glossed oh, yeah. over a little bit earlier. We got we got it okay. we got into the cool factor, and I'm just realizing that people are hearing us say this and and are like, "What is this?" So, well, it's a stone that ate a lot of spinach, and so it became a Popeye's <laughs> stone. And it's, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, this is one of the great things about the internet is we can just direct people to type uh, uh, Popeye birdstone into their favorite search engine, and they'll get a bunch of photographs and, and yeah. images and drawings and publications too. Um, and and the truth is I'm not any kind of an expert on Popeye birdstones. I've only ever had to deal with one of them in my entire career. But but uh, but they're essentially these um, effigies of what look like birds. They're often made of slate or some kind of um, stone like that. Um, and uh, they have a, a flanged tail and they have two eyes that pop out from the head, and they almost always have holes drilled in them. So they're clearly, they were attached to something. Now, what were they attached to and why? That's the big question. Some people think they were spear thrower weights. Some people think that the eyes pop out because the they, they were put on the top of the spear thrower and uh, the uh, the spear was balanced between the eyes when you, you, when you threw it, okay? Um, there, some people think that they used to be called banner stones and people thought that they were put on poles and held up and they were some kind of effigy that was used to identify groups or something like that. There's a million different ideas about how they were used. The truth is we have no idea because nobody's actually ever seen anyone use one. 
So they, they are is, known only from the archaeological record. Late archaic to early woodland for the listeners. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So 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 sort of like four thousand to like twenty five hundred years ago, kind of in there. Yeah. Part, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. But but uh. I, so I didn't realize that's why banner stones are called banner stones is because they were thought to be like flag waving. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I like I talk about banner stones in my class. I guess I didn't really think about where the the etymology of the uh, right. of the word. And and while we're on these kind of stones, and this is a bit of a a bit of a um, 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 uh, a left hand turn, but um, um, I don't know if anybody's made this argument about bird stones, but other kinds of um, of uh, banner stones, like the, particularly the ones with wings on them, there is an article out somewhere. Um, that talks about the fact that they might be silencers for spear throwers. That somehow so, having that winged weight on it cuts down the amount of noise that the spear thrower makes when you whip it through the air, and therefore they're less likely to spook the deer before the spear is in its throat. Kind so, of thing. so was this an article, Dave, or was this? So I was going to bring up the anecdote because I I, I TA'd uh, an ancient technology class at UNB when I was do in grad school and we had some students who <clears throat> were doing a project on banner stones and the project that they were doing was to try to figure out whether the banner stones actually improve the accuracy of an atlatl and and so they set up this like camera and microphone set up and oh, and uh, they made they made atlatls and they made spears and they threw them and what they discovered was that they were really bad at throwing spears with an atlatl and that the banner stones in no way could Im improve their accuracy at all. But because they had the microphone set up, they caught this like th thing where the, there was this whooshing noise with the throwing of the atlatl. And then when they throw, they put the, uh, the banner stone on, it silenced it. It like, so there wasn't a whooshing noise uh, associated with those ones. And I, I, I was sort of struck by like, this actually, is this real? Like this, and and I, sure I, I'll admit there's... I've never gone back to kind of explore this any further. But there's a couple of undergrads at UNB who uh, I, I don't know. This would have been 15 years ago now. Um, who who did a project that may may have been like sort of groundbreaking experimental archaeology. So well, uh, on the internet, William Atlatl Bob Perkins in 1992 uh, posited that theory as well. So okay, Atlatl Bob. Sorry to disappoint. Right. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Shout out to so, Atlanta Bob. I'm sure he's listening. Yeah. <laughs> and and Dave, that wasn't, I mean, left turns are sort of what this what this program is is built on, uh tangents and and uh and hard hard turns. But so but so, that's why we have to bring him back to sorry, Ken, to what his exactly and, what and, the and most, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm bringing him back here and sorry, Ken got and, the wild eyes listener, and I thought we were gonna <laughs> crash this thing. So so have you have you guys heard the the famous quote that uh that digression is the soul of academia? No, <laughs> who's okay, that from? We're, li we're living proof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm digression and and uh, uh, at uh, I don't know I don't know if it's academia at my point of digression, but uh, <laughs> um, so we we've, we've talked a lot about uh, we started on kind of the positivity with um, uh, no, kind of interesting sorry, I have outcomes. To stop you. Sorry, kid, because we still haven't had Dave answer the question. What is the most interesting thing that he's seen in a collection? Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Unless it was the birdstone. It's a, it's an impossible question, but um, I know that we want to talk about George Frederick Clark at some point, and I, yeah. I have to tell you, when we first got the George Frederick Clark collection at uh, UNB, uh, there's that one late archaic gouge. Do you know the one I'm talking about? It's a half channel gouge. Yeah. It's yep. absolutely perfectly preserved it still has the cutting edge on it it doesn't even have any use wear from the last time it was used i'm sure it must have been sharpened like the minute before it went into the archaeological record it, it is one of the most stunning pieces of stonework i have ever seen cool well, so i'm glad you brought that up dave because <laughs> what, what, what i was trying to do was uh uh uh, no, Gabe no, Ken, let me figuring... stop you. No. <laughs> Gabe, Gabe and I are still trying to figure out how to how to do interviews. I don't know if we've we've uh, we've discovered that interviewing people is actually much harder than than just talking for two hours straight with the two of us. Yeah. Um, so we, we started on 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 um, some really like sort of tangential outcome of of sort of engaging with uh, uh, collectors and that like basically driving this work at Rum Beach. Um, and we talked, we got mired in kind of the the sort of 
the muddy gray area of working with collectors. But but you also we we want to end on kind of another high note, and that is so um, we talked about how you manage these collections long term, what happens to the long term, um, and you brought up the George Frederick Clark collection and. Gabe and I were both graduate students when the process of acquiring this collection was realized, uh, basically, and and those collections arrived at UNB. And so um, uh, this is a significant artifact collection. It's it's probably one of the largest private collections in the Maritimes um, uh, that that has gone through sort of a formal donation process. So could you tell us a little bit about um, Dr. Clark? Um, the, the significance of the and the archaeological legacy of the collection. So for those of you that don't know, Clark did a lot of work uh, collecting uh, in parts of the Wolostog that are now actually underwater behind the Mactaquac Dam. And so some of sort of the objects from that collection are actually some of the only information we have about um, the middle Wolostog, uh, at least below sort of like uh, Woodstock. Um, so you want to tell us about the GFC collection and Dr. Clark and, and um, what sort of uh, how that came about and 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 how that is sort of one of these good news stories about uh, archaeologist collector relationships. Yes, I'm uh, I'm happy to do that, and uh, I'm glad you asked about it because it's the George Harry Clark collection is a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier, and that is giving mm -hmm. artifacts a future. You know, um, so George Frederick Clark was a dentist. He lived in Woodstock, New Brunswick, most of his life. He grew up there, um, but being a dentist was just his day job. He was a professional writer. He wrote nonfiction. He wrote fiction uh, all through his career, all through his life. Um, but the other thing he was was a self-educated avocational archaeologist, and he started uh, getting involved in uh, archaeological work um, seriously in the mid-1920s, and he continued doing field work up until the early 1960s. Um, so he had a long career. And it happens that his career coincided with a time when there was virtually no professional archaeology, well, very little professional archaeology being done in New Brunswick from, you know, really from the First World War through to about, there's a little bit of work done after the after about 1950, but but between the First World War and 1950, he was really the only show in town in terms of archaeology in New Brunswick. Um, and um, he mostly collected artifacts and excavated sites on the upper reaches of the um, uh, the Miramichi River and then on the central uh, part of the uh, St. John River. And as Ken just said, um, his collection of artifacts is the only evidence we have now for, um, I'm sure, several dozen archaeological sites that are now under the head pond um, that was created when the Mactaquac Dam was built uh, just upriver from Fredericton in the 1960s. Um, and uh, I should point out that Clark was uh, very, very much opposed to having that dam put in, and it cost him personally that opposition. Um, and uh, because he foresaw what would happen not only to uh, to the archaeological sites and the people who lived in the valley, but also to to uh, salmon, uh, because the other thing that he was was a fly fisherman and a guy who promoted salmon fishing. Yeah, and he writes and about an that expert too, hypnotist. Like... <laughs> oh, sorry, an expert hypnotist as well, was he not? Uh, th that was an early career uh, thing that uh, he got over, I think. Yeah. Oh, I uh, see. I see. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and uh, so we we should we should say I mean, you might want to put these in your show notes. Yeah. But uh, but uh, Clark's book, someone before us, uh, which was the first book length thing written on New Brunswick archaeology, his two fishing books, and uh, and his granddaughter Mary Bernard's biography of George Frederick Clark. All of those are must reads for people who are interested in New Brunswick archaeology. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I particularly yeah. recommend um, I mean, you've got an intro in the in the most recent someone before us. And I, I know that's available still at Westminster. And, and Murray Bernard's book is really extraordinary. It, it is. And it's out in paperback now. You don't have okay. to go back. And it's yeah. and it, it is an extraordinary book in many ways and tells a whole bunch of stories about uh, uh, about um, archaeology and, and Clark, but just about 
there are also political stories in there about New Brunswick that people may not be familiar with. Yeah. I, I yeah. found there, there was a lot of stuff just as a, you know, someone who, who didn't grow up in New Brunswick, a lot of things I didn't know about the province that I learned from that from that book, which uh, yeah. I think is what you're alluding to. Yeah. And the, end, the other two books uh, for the listener, and again, it'll be in the show notes, are Six Salmon River, Six Salmon Rivers, and then Song of the Real. Um, and he's also got, what's the the Acadians book? Um, it's on my... Uh, yeah. There, there's there's uh, two or three historical things he did. He did some uh, young adult fiction. He did, he did some adult fiction. Yeah, and he's he wrote a lot of different kinds of things. Yeah, but there's but there's archaeo. So so someone before us is the is the most archaeological. But Six Salmon Rivers has has some archaeology, and and even songs Song of the Real has some yeah. stories about archaeology. And what's interesting is that um, he tells stories from the perspective of a collector and sort of like the sort of quirky happenstance that leads to him finding some of this stuff you know he's like kind of wandering off from a conversation and and you know i i, I don't know how much of this stuff was uh fictionalized and kind of uh uh brought into a narrative form but uh but he does a good job of sort of um describing kind of the the interest and the um excitement of of finding stuff and and why why he was so passionate about this yeah yeah it, it, it's it, those those books are amazing documents and and uh, the collection itself, um, I mean, we've we've made some progress with uh, with um, uh, produce having students write theses on aspects of the uh, of the collection. Uh, we've got a few publications out on it. We've done a bunch of conference papers on it. I think it's still, uh, unfortunately, quite underexploited in terms of a research collection, um, but. Um, it's there at the university now. And so if people are interested, there's still lots of research avenues they could go down with it. And in fact, Gabe just had a graduate student who um, who defended his thesis a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. It's partly based on George Frederick Clark's projectile points. That's right. Yeah. So Paul Schweitzer included, he was doing, uh, working on the bow and arrow transit, basically the atlatl to bow and arrow transition in the region. And so he measured uh, the projectile points in that collection and uh, did a nice job with it. Um, and then we should plug the other theses too, which includes uh, Cora Woolsey on the ceramics from the George Frederick Clark collection and um, Alex Peltier-Misho on um, the Bristol Shiktahawk cache from that collection. Yep. And that's Ashley Brzezicki on the... That's right. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, that's getting a handle on the ground stone, I think. Um yeah. And does that that brings us around? I think to all the theses, and then, uh, well, I mean, um, in, in a way, I guess there's been a sort of spinoff with uh, um, Al Hansinger's interest in Hinkley Point uh, meta sediment or whatever we're calling it, because that appears in the cache. But so right. it, it's certainly been an exciting, uh, an exciting collection, and and um, and you've done some public archaeology with that as well. I recall going to Woodstock with you to set up the exhibit case at the library there. Yep, there's a there's an exhibit from the collection at at the library in Woodstock, uh, and that was actually Clark set that precedent because he had two display cases made that um, that were in for for several decades were in the um, the Woodstock library before we acquired the collection. Now one of them is back there with his artifacts in it. Uh, there's also a collection at the Salmon Museum in Boys Town or Dope Town. Dope Town. Uh, yes. Yeah. I yeah. I went there with you, so I should remember what the town is, but that was <laughs> right. a fun trip. That was a funny trip because we went to deal with one a vocational collection and ended up looking at a different one. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and um, we did the other display case that uh, Dr. Clark had made is now in our in our uh, in the lab at the, uh, the university that's named for him, the George Frederick Clark um, um, Archaeological Teaching Laboratory. Right. So um, so we do have some public display stuff out on it as well. Yeah, and Clark Clark was eventually awarded an, an honorary doctorate from UNB. Indeed, he was. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think. Am I am I correct? That was mostly related to the Macquack Dam thing, as well as his writing, or, or the Macquack Dam thing. We torpedoed it, and then he was shown to be sort of prescient. Is that accurate? I uh, I don't I don't remember the whole story about that, but yes, there were there were many con convoluted. Um, um, things about that about that doctorate but he did finally get it a few years before he died good yeah yeah excellent um well uh gentlemen the uh are we looking at half uh finished bottles of covassier are we are we reaching final questions i see ken chomping at the bit here the listeners should know that that this is actually we, we we're prone to ken and i used to um 
try to schedule meetings with Dave for about Friday at about three o'clock because that was like the the <laughs> latest on a Friday you felt like you could you could pretend to still be working but still probably convince Dave that the meeting should take place at the grad house and uh, yeah. and Ken and I <laughs> We, we made a habit of pushing for the three or the three thirty meeting that might migrate so we could keep doing this with Dave. But uh, yeah. what else have you got, Ken? I, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but uh, no, uh, not you, <laughs> but you, uh, you alluded to sort of uh, some of the first collector contacts landed you uh, in Washington Walk Lake. And we've talked a lot about your work in the Quaddy. And so do you want to talk a little bit about basically the work that led to um, kind of what is the seminal paper on the Washington Walk Lake chert source? Um, and, uh, and the work that came out of that just briefly about how, you know, this is kind of a, to end on another story about how collector relationships basically landed you, uh, um, on some re on a research path that I, that my career basically has benefited from. So that actually isn't so much a collector story. And let me preface this by saying that your dissertation are now the seminal documents on the Washington Oak Lake Church Source. Okay, just to <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, what how that happened was um, um, I had never really thought very much about doing research on the history of archaeology before I came to New Brunswick, and uh, um, and uh, when I first came here, Chris Turnbull, who was provincial archaeologist at the time, just gave me a quick list of things that you might want to read, you know, that uh, that are that are in print about about New Brunswick, just to give you an idea of what's been done here, because it's kind of the flavor of the place kind of thing. And one of the things that he put on that was um, uh, George Frederick Matthews' um, uh, paper on uh, the um, uh, uh, shell bearing site at uh, Bocabec, and the other one was the Washington Oak Lake Church Source, which Chris had looked at for um, uh, when he was first provincial archaeologist. And I was intrigued by the story about the church source, but but it was like um, more than a decade before I actually started to do any research. So so and and before that, I started to get interested in this whole nineteenth century archaeology thing that went on with natural history historians doing archaeology in New Brunswick. So that so that was more of a history of archaeology project, the way that I conceived it, rather than. Um, something that had to do with collectors. The collectors with their odd pieces of Washington Oak Church came along later. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, ended up that, uh, that the, one of the collectors that I work with is lives on essentially the property that is the site that Matthew describes in that paper, basically. So right, right. Uh, uh, the, the other end of that site is, is actually held in a private collection. And one that I've had the opportunity to see that includes some incredible material. Uh, that's not all from that point of land one of the islands nearby, but um, demonstrates, you know, something like 5,500 years of history in that, in that particular area. So yeah, I was at a Cambridge Narrows this summer uh, for a wedding and stayed at a, a bed and breakfast with a bunch of folks. And, and the bed and breakfast is, is uh, decorated primarily with Washington Oak chert and antique furniture. Those are the, that's, that was the motif, yeah. you know, the Excellent. large I'm going to have to visit. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. I, I picked up their card because I thought it might be a sort of fun, uh, fun little field trip out to a uh, nice view of the, of the, uh, the lake and so forth. Yeah. But um, uh, Dave, is there anything you'd like to uh, leave us with about uh, collaborations with collectors that we haven't uh, maybe haven't picked your mind about yet? Or I've got a, a question for for you guys, and and that is, I, early on, I said that my impression was that there was not very much of a problem in New Brunswick with um, with uh, people illegal illegally excavating archaeological sites or for that matter, selling archeological objects, either online or otherwise. And, and uh, I wondered, is that, is that your impression too? And does that contrast with the situation on the other side of the border in Maine? That's for you particularly, Gabe. Yeah, I mean, so it's an interesting question. It, it, it does match my perception of it. Um, I think the, it's one of these things that I think uh, if you compare it to the other side of the border, I also don't think there's a huge looting problem there either. I think um, what people sometimes accentuate is the amount of stuff people are collecting from intertidal zones and then that they are putting online. Um, so uh, Josh Cummings, who we've had, we've talked to before, you know, follows pretty religiously these, these various sites, you know, and, and always knows what's going on online. Um, and I think, 
what that maybe is is more of a technological shift than it is an actual shift in practice. Um, and I'm inclined to think that the, that turn to the internet to kind of share those collections, um, if anything, it represents sort of a shortcoming um, of archaeologists who could be providing more of that feedback, more of that positive reinforcement about um, what's interesting and, and what people have found. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I've only seen, I would say, one badly looted site in my career. It was in Nova Scotia. Um, and I'm inclined to think that was a sort of unique circumstance by that site being on an island, fairly isolated. And I think probably looted by by one or two people, not not as a sort of communal effort. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I don't, I don't think it's a, an, a problem, but without question, like I've come across, um, I've had conversations with people um, and come across like basically documentation of looting in New Brunswick that, you know, has happened relatively recently. Um, but it's not clear to me the scope of it, right? Like, I don't know if it's a, if it's a pervasive issue. I doubt it is. I don't, I like, I don't get the sense it is, but it is happening. Um, and, you know, and, and I mean, some of this is, uh, I, I think Gabe kind of touched on this, you know, the, the, maybe the archaeologists aren't doing enough. We've talked about this in the context of, um, you know, the, the, <laughs> to get back to ancient apocalypse and, and pseudo archaeology stuff is, is sort of this vilification of archaeologists in some way that kind of is ivory tower, you know, gatekeepers. And I wonder if like, maybe that's stoking some of this fear in terms of like sharing on the internet as opposed to kind of reaching out to an archaeologist. But um, I, I do think too that in New Brunswick, there, it's kind of been the media around archaeology has also been really problematic. Like I remember there was a CBC article the that treasure we buddies. all had to, the treasure buddies thing that we had to respond to as the APA and B um, because, you know, it was, um, I, I think that metal detecting is probably something that is happening and metal tech detecting leading to digging kind of thing that, that that's obviously happening enough that it's being promoted on, in a, on the CBC morning program uh, one day. And, and, and so, so I don't think it's prolific. I think it is there. And I think some of this is something that we've talked about a number of times, Gabe, you and I, and with other folks, and that is that, you know, the opportunities for education about archeology span aren't, as prevalent in New Brunswick, we don't have an active archaeological society. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and I think that I, it, you know, there is a responsibility on our parts to kind of be more present and be more available. Um, and as you said, David, it may simply just be like, take people seriously when they send you an email and, and, uh, um, you know, engage with it to the point that at least they get some feedback and, and, uh, um, you know, that there's something that there's a, a, an acknowledgement that there's two ways of there's a two way communication between the public and, and, and archeologists that, that opens up that conversation. I think maybe that's uh that's the take home point listener is that we should try to open up these, uh, these lines of communication and um, Dave, uh, we want to thank you very much for coming on. We've been, we've been, I think oh, teasing the listener for, for two me. seasons about this, that we were going to have <laughs> you on. And, and I think you've only made a brief appearance so far live from the lunar rogue. And uh you know, if if you're you're the sort of patron saint of this uh, of this podcast, so we really appreciate you coming on and taking the time. Uh, you're absolutely welcome. I've enjoyed it immensely, and I and I have fond memories of those of uh, three thirty on a Friday afternoon <laughs> meetings at the uh, Grant House. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Some of which Me I remember, too. and some of which I don't, because uh, <laughs> uh, even 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 after the meeting ended, Dave, you would go home, and Gabe and I would just go to a different location <laughs> to continue that meeting. That was the yeah, yeah. that was the problem. So, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks again, Dave. I, I we really appreciate you making the time and and uh, uh, you know just sharing sharing the information and kind of you know leading us down a path where we're I think we're our thinking about this this uh is is really driven with conversations we've had with you and and with like Sue and and other folks too that uh, that have a very positive relationship with uh with collectors and 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 we hope that the public uh that uh, that's listening to this program actually gets a sense that you know there are pathways forward with this relationship and and uh that are in your backyard basically so yeah, and we'll look forward to finding we've we've got plenty of just in the show notes alone. We'll have plenty of reasons to get Dave back on to talk about stuff here. So I mean, I, I'm thinking an obvious option here would be intertidal sites uh, from the transitional archaic would be a would be a good show. So exactly, exactly. So yeah. and and I think we actually I I, I think we snagged the uh, the episode title to giving artifacts a future. That's uh oh there we uh, go. Uh, it's very complimentary to to the the episode title that uh, that's going to come out this week. So. That's right. Yeah. Um, Looking forward to seeing it. 
Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, uh, well, listener, we, uh, we'll uh, transition, I guess, over to hit pieces now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ken, I think it's time for our uh, hit pieces this week. And today we're going to start off with a little bit of reporting from uh, ProPublica. Uh, and that's an article called Tribes in Maine Spent Decades Fighting to Rebury Ancestral Remains. Harvard Resisted Them at Nearly Every Turn. And so this is an interesting um, article that for uh, those of you working uh, in the Northeast, the, one of the, the kind of major site in question here is the Nevin site, uh, which is a site in Midcoast, Maine, that had um, ancestral remains. And... Um, Part of that collection was at the Peabody Museum, Harvard. Part of that collection was at the Peabody Museum at Phillips Andover Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. And um, the article is a piece of really in-depth reporting about the um, work the Wabanaki uh, community has done to try to repatriate um human remains and associated funerary objects from those sites and the different approaches that those two different institutions have taken towards it. Um, highly recommend the article. There's a lot of interesting material in there, uh, you know, including uh, a lot of sort of uh, really uh, extensive Freedom of Information uh, Act request gathered emails, yeah. um, some of which uh, are are well worth reading, all of which, in fact, are well worth reading. Um and I, I think you'd also I just kind of want to highlight, uh, in, in my view, anyway, there's some people, some folks I've worked with um, in the Andover or uh, from the Phillips Andover Academy who justifiably come across extremely well in that article. And I just want to kind of say that it totally fits my personal interactions with uh, with all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting article and and uh, and uh, another piece that is uh, open access for for our listeners to That's take a right. look at. Yep. Um, and, and, and on and that note. Sorry, just oh, to interrupt a part of a broader series that ProPublica is doing on repatriation. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. And I, I think we, I feel like you sent me one of these ones earlier on in the series uh, um, uh, about, yeah, they've, there was a story map one that went with this, wasn't there? Am um, I misremembering that? I think you're thinking of something slightly different, although I could be wrong, but they've, they're doing a lot of work on the degree to which various institutions are NAGPRA compliant or not. Right. Um, yeah. And those have all been pretty interesting. It might be worth uh, posting our um, the talk that um, Marla uh, Marla yep. gave uh, for the AP and B on the background behind NAGPRA and and Marla who works for one of these Peabody institutions. That's uh, right. Yeah. yeah. For the so, for the for the Andover. Andover. <laughs> we should yes, say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the Peabody. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so on on open access um, and on the subject of uh, David Black, who uh, joined us just uh, in this past episode, um, we're going to highlight the um, expanded and revised version of the uh, Gathering Pebbles on a, oh, I opened up the wrong version. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's yes, uh, revised, get... and ex revised and extended version of Gathering Pebbles on a Boundless Shore. The, the director's site. cut, I believe, is what we're calling it. The director's that. cut. This is the, yeah. this is the, um, the, the Snyder cut of, uh, of <laughs> Gathering Pebbles on a Boundless Shore, Rum Beach site and intertidal archaeology in the Canadian Kauai region. Um, and, and this is Dave's, um, uh, it's, it's sort of a, it's a published monograph basically about the archaeology of the work. Uh, that he's done there uh, in the last, uh, uh, what is it, 30 years now, uh, three decades. Um, and the distinctive artifact assemblage that was recovered there from the intertidal zone, um, particularly in around Rum Beach uh, and the Bliss Islands, um, some really fascinating uh, uh, lithic technological uh, data, as long as like a petrographic analysis, um, description of artifacts, and uh, kind of giving that context. And as Dave talked about, um, sort of noting that the positioning of this site um, is not what was anticipated. And so his rethinking on how we understand um, basically patterning of, of transitional or terminal archaic sites uh, in the Quadi region and, and highlighting the role that avocational archaeologists and collectors in the region have played in um, kind of un, un, unconcealing or uh, revealing that, uh, that uh, um, uh, the unconcealing is not I like a unconcealing. Word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, revealing that archaeological <laughs> record, um, and and that is uh, published through the University of New Brunswick. Um, I, there's a uh, 
some web hosting service, but uh, the library we'll link, repository, yeah. library repository, and so we'll link directly to the monograph uh, for those of you who are interested in reading it. listeners thank you very much for tuning in this fortnight and um we're going into the holiday season ken so i think that we are um do, i think we're gonna uh get this one up and then we're gonna have a sort of special year in review episode yep uh, uh, I, hope I don't I know if we'll just... have a top 10 or anything like that but uh, uh we will have a year in review i think it'll be just a gabe and ken episode and yeah we'll, we'll i'll say it's gonna be half an hour to 45 minutes but um you know it it may be something that you listen to on boxing day uh uh you know that plays yeah. for about three hours and we've always wanted a show that starts it sometimes listener we know the show feels like it starts in 2023 and ends in 2024 but maybe this will be one that actually does you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> gave and ken's special new year's episode so they... <laughs> there you go <laughs> all right listener well we will see you in about a fortnight uh and uh thanks very much for tuning in thanks very much dave black and uh with uh more soon yep thank you listener see you in a fortnight Thank you.